this is what I see when I get, uh, I see this kind of distress when I get an alienated child in my office. And this is a younger child, so you can see the kind of the anguish and the pain and the anxiety. When I get an older child, I get um, a, a, an enraged teenager in my office. This is the part of alienation two years ago that probably captured me and allowed me to, uh, forced me to find a way to continue to do this work. These children are um, psychologically wounded and um, it is why I uh, teach that parental alienation is not a parental rights issue, it's a children's mental health issue. Um, the importance of the topic and the importance of understanding the topic begins with the realization that our children are not objects to be possessed, uh, controlled, or manipulated. They come here with their own beautiful agendas for this life. And our job as parents is to support and nurture that unique um, seed inside of each one of them so that they grow and flourish to be exactly who they are. Um, it is our responsibility when we see these children being manipulated and exploited to provide intervention that decreases the likelihood that a false narrative of fear, abuse, abandonment created by the uh, selfish and sick needs of a mentally ill parent, or at least a very dysfunctional parent, replaces a child's genuine and authentic loving relationship with a parent, with a good enough parent. I use that term because one of the primary tactics of an alienating parent is that they will take the normal parenting flaws and the normal personality quirks in a parent and turn them into allegations of abuse and neglect to substantiate their own need for the child to not have a relationship with the other parent and also to su substantiate the child's professed wishes to not have a relationship with the other parent. This is another way of looking at the alienation reaction in a child. Uh, to have kind of a, a linear uh, view of it sometimes is helpful in understanding it. Where we're talking about mild and at risk, um, describing this part of the continuum as transitional difficulties. Um, the next moderate level, they're still going to see the parent, but they're not really talking to the parent or they're trying to decrease their time with the parent. We might call that resist and refusal dynamic. You might hear that some in the language. Um, but they haven't stopped going. The tipping point and the place that they enter into a severe alienation reaction is with the complete refusal for contact. <clears throat> One of the ways to talk about how parental alienation happens is to focus on the transition between the homes. Um, I find that uh, this is the place where we will most likely see the very beginning signs of alienation is in the transition period. Um, let's see. The transition bridge is a concept that was de uh, developed by Karen and Nick Woodall basically to illustrate the emotional, psychological, and sometimes geographical divide that opens up for a child after the parents divorce or separate. Um, this uh, depiction allows us to see how a child may begin going from home to home, um, but eventually not be able to make that transition anymore. Um, as you can see, uh, we have parent, mom on one side, dad on the other. Um, <coughs> The child's job is to cross this bridge to make it into the other parent's environment, right? They used to have a unified experience of their parent in one home. So the child's psychological task is to begin to have independent relationships with each of their parents. 
The bridge represents the psychological constructs and the coping mechanisms that a child uses to make these mm -hmm. transitions. The space underneath the bridge represents the new psychological space that the child has had to create after the separation and the divorce. Like I said, the parents are no longer under the same roof. They have to find a way within their psyche to move from one attachment figure to the other attachment figure. When parents are working well together and they're amicable and they're getting along, I imagine that this bridge is something that the child never has to cross on completely on their own. Because what happens is mom and dad help the child across because they're supportive and they understand that the child's going through a huge change in their life, right? So they provide emotional support. They're aware that the child is um, probably stressed and might be scared that one of the homes, possibly two, are new, completely new environments for the child. So I imagine that mom and dad do this together, right? One, this is a handoff for parents who are working well. They're walking the child there, somebody else takes a hand, they walk the child back. The child is never alone to go through this. But when the, when the parents are so absorbed in their own independent experiences of being the new parent, or perhaps their grief and their anger, and they're setting up their new lives as single parents, the, the fact that their child's got this huge process in front of them just goes completely ignored. As the child, to complicate that, one parent or both parents may be absorbed in a great deal of hostility towards the other and may be sending <coughs> negative messages to the child. Um, the coping mechanisms begin to kind of fall out as they make this transition over and over and over again. And they hear that the complaints and the sadness and the grief and how dad's not doing something right, how mom's not doing something right. They forget their backpacks and they have to go back over and mom's really mad that she has to get up at nine o'clock at night and go get the textbook or go get the soccer clothes. And see, the coping mechanisms are falling out. It's not that they're not resilient. It's not that the children can't make the change, but to continue to go through the hostility of the parents and the poor parenting uh, reactions will completely deplete eventually their ability to psychologically cope with these transactions. So if you can imagine a child, <clears throat> let me just talk about it this way, child's with one parent, right, they have to power up that attachment to that unique parent that they have and they have to get involved with that parent and then it's time to go back. So then they have to power down that attachment, right? And move into the space of the other parent who's completely different and power up a brand new attachment to that parent. It is a lot of psychological work if the parents aren't working together. And the more that they're not working together, the more the child has to keep it distinct, right? It becomes a very compartmentalized. You've seen kids like this. I have my life here, and I have my life here. And the two never mix, and we never talk about it, and um, that's the way they deal with it. They're getting more and more basic in their ability to cope when they're doing that compartmentalization. So eventually, the bridge wears out. And that's when the child can't go. They can't cross anymore. They are depleted, they're psychologically, they're emotionally depleted, and they cannot cross over. And that's when the split occurs. That's when you see the child enter into what we as psychologists call um, a psychologically <coughs> split frame of mind. It's when they are dealing with the relationships and the hostilities between their parents by completely cutting off one parent. And temporarily, it does provide them a reprieve from the stress. Because they're not going anywhere. They don't have to do that power up, power down thing. They don't have to listen to all that you know, anymore. They don't have to see the distress over here with dad all, all the time. They don't have to hear about mom all the time. But 
that is a great cost to their future development as a human being because splitting is an infantile defense mechanism. What does that mean? That means when a baby comes into the world in their first year of life and they are overwhelmed with everything you can imagine, people in their faces, wet white bees, dry white bees, bottles that work, bottles that don't work, breasts that work, breasts that don't work, and they are trying to um, internalize and make sense of all of this stimuli, they have, they do that by creating two very distinct categories, the good box and the bad box. Things that come in that are pleasant and make them feel better go into the good box. And things that come in and don't feel good go into the bad box. Um, <clears throat> it is a way that an infant organizes their life. And so when we see an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, 15-year-old in our office, managing their parent relationship with splitting, we know that they are in psychological crisis. We know that they have regressed to the most basic of coping mechanisms because their age-appropriate coping mechanisms did not work. And that's the danger of that. And to rebuild that bridge when I get a, a severely alienated child in my office, to completely rebuild that bridge is um, nothing less than Shakespearean in effort because what you have to do to get that child back across is to take them back across a deep divide of rage and anger about what has occurred to them. 